when you're thinking about buying art as an investment, when you're a beginning collector, you stumble upon the following problem, the main problem, which art to buy. And so art investment funds come in really, really handy because those experts will decide which investments are really good for you. And as a beginning collector, that sounds amazing. So let's talk about that. What's an art investment fund or art hedge fund or fine art fund, however you want to call it. It's basically you giving them money, experts who will buy paintings and artworks and objects, store them into warehouses up until the day they get sold, out of which the profits will be divided among the investors. Now, this sounds amazing in the beginning. Experts deciding you, about your investment so that you can get that uh, cumulative return, that appreciation over time in your pockets. It sounds amazing until you realize that number one, the inherent lack of liquidity within the arts meets super high transaction costs, higher than almost any other financial asset, together with high maintenance costs, insurances, etc., 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 and you realize that you're paying full dollars and more for something that might not even work. So in this video, we will explain everything you need to know about art investment funds so that you can know why you should perhaps invest or why you should not invest at all. Now, the first thing that we have to understand is that those experts have insane credentials, insane business credentials, oftentimes investment credentials behind their name, but they have no practical experience or oftentimes no practical experience with investing in art. They've never maintained a collection. They never really bought pieces. They don't really know how that goes, how hard that is, how long it takes to search for particular paintings, to then get access to perhaps buying them or not buying them and buying them story, maintenance, insurance, all of that stuff. They don't have real experience with that. And so oftentimes what happens is that they underestimate those things. They underestimate those costs. They underestimate how much time it takes to sell paintings, for example, to find collectors and how much money you have to pour in to do that. Because if you want to hire somebody, finding those collectors, those are people that need to be paid with your money. And so, so that's a real problem. And because of that, what they do is they rely on a board of panel members that can advise them. Now, these panel members, of course, have experience with the arts. But what happens is that insane fees are being paid there. Why? Because most inside people in the art world, they don't really like art investment funds. Why? Because it doesn't really work. And it kind of goes against the true nature of collecting art. And so the only way you can convince those people to be in those boards is by paying them huge fees. Fees that come, of course, out of your pockets as an investor. So the first thing you need to understand is that all those experts of that investment fund, they don't really have a foot in the door in the art world. A lot of times beginning collectors think that they are experts and therefore have access and real connections and a real network in that high-end art market. And that oftentimes is not true. And so, and, and plus on top of that, they don't really do any of the buying and selling. For that, they have to rely on other institutions, gallerists, dealers, auction houses, etc. And so those dealers, will ask 12% or higher, which is something that you will pay. And those auction houses, depending on the size of the pieces and, 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 and the importance of the pieces will um, ask more or less. And so, but oftentimes, oftentimes more, because if you want to go for less, you have to, yeah, you have to invest in, in pieces that are millions of euros. And so, um, so this is really important to understand. They don't do the buying and selling themselves. So you will always pay buying commissions and selling commissions, buyer premiums and seller premiums. And so this is, this is one of the reasons why you as a collector will pay more when you're in an art investment fund 
for every artwork that will be bought then in the normal stream of things where you as a collector would individually buy a particular piece. Now, on top of that, there are a lot of maintenance costs and insurance costs. Now, if your investment in the art investment fund raises in value, there are costs connected to that. Insurance costs will raise in value. When the investment grows, the insurance will grow with it. This is something that oftentimes get, um, gets underestimated by those by those experts then we're all of course talking about the fees to the panel the, the advisors and all of that stuff and then on top of that you also have to take into account that an investment fund will take about a 15 percent profit probably so in total you're you're probably looking at an extra cost for that investment of 30 to 40 percent in total and so so this is a real cost if you're gonna pay 30-40% more than a normal price, it's already something to think twice about. Now let's take a closer look into an example of an art investment fund, the British Rail Pension Art Fund. Now in somewhere late 20th century, they decided to take $100 million and put it into art. Now they asked Sotheby's to do the decisioning and all of that stuff. And in total, they bought 2,400 objects. And they hold on to those objects for about 12 years. Now, after those 12 years, the investment grew in value and they started selling. Now, here's the thing. It took them 12 years to sell their holdings. That's 12 years. That's the lack of liquidity in the arts. And on those 12 years of collecting, on those 24 years in total, uh, they made about 11.3% compound interest annually. Now, this is a pretty decent result. It's a pretty, pretty decent result. It's also one of the better examples. If you go to other examples, you will see less results. Oftentimes, this example is shown because it is kind of in, in, in the benefit of those art investment funds because it was a success to some extent. Because when we look at where the profits lie out of those 2,400 objects, we see that the majority of profits came from 25 impressionistic paintings. So this is a really, really interesting thing. 25 impressionistic paintings that are responsible for the majority of profits. Now, if you've watched my other videos on art collecting, then you know that there's a huge similarity between investing in startups and investing in emerging art or in art in general. And so a lot of those tactics are overlapping. Now, if you look at one of the um, all-time classics in the, the business world and, and investment world, we look at Peter Thiel, one of his investment rules is a very interesting one to connect to this one. Um, the power law tactic. Now, what Peter Thiel saw when he looked at his own portfolio and the portfolio of all his investment friends is that oftentimes, not really oftentimes, actually always, the following thing happens. A couple of companies, one or two or three, that were responsible for the majority of profits. And take those one, two, three companies out and suddenly your investments are negative. You don't have an ROI anymore. And so what this observation implied was the power law tactic, which is the following thing. It is compiled of two principles. Principle number one, always and only invest in companies that have the potential of return larger than your entire fund. And rule number two, or principle number two, because rule number one, is so restrictive, you cannot really have a second principle. And so this is a really powerful tactic that is being used by top investors in the startup world, in the VC world, um, and, and also in the art world. Now, if you think about this tactic, you can understand that it's way too much of a risky tactic for investment funds who need some kind of certainty to use. They cannot really use that. We see that observation in the art world also over and over and over again, but, but those investment funds cannot use that tactic. Why? Because it's too risky. They need a conservative approach to sell to their investors. A risky track record just doesn't attract 
investors. And so what's going to happen inevitably is that that conservative attitude, which, by the way, is possible in other types of investments, becomes impossible in the art world. Why? Because the transaction costs, the insurance costs, maintenance costs, um, um, the fees to your advisory board, uh, all of those costs are just way too high. You cannot hold on to your holdings in that world without a significant cost. And so... In that world, that conservative investment approach just simply doesn't play out. That's why we see all these investment funds or the majority of investment funds kind of failing. And that's why people in the inside art world, I'm sorry, most of the times don't really put too much value on art investment funds. And to conclude this video, I would recommend the following thing. If you're a beginning collector, Go for art investment funds if you want to, but understand that the, that one of the values that you will get out of it is probably predominantly social. Connecting with all those investors that are doing the same thing and, and talking with them and building your network out, that's probably going to be the best part of it. Because if you're going for the money, just don't go for art investment funds. That's my recommendation. Now, if you want to know more, about collecting as a beginning art collector, then definitely check out one of my other videos. It's linked up right now. Anyway, like, subscribe. This channel is all about the business side of the art, several videos a week. So if you want that, just subscribe and uh, see you next time. Ciao, 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 ciao.